In the 1930s, while the West was in crisis, the world witnessed the birth of a giant, the Soviet Union. With its five-year plans, forced collectivization and huge public works, communism dominated nature and transformed mankind. In opposition to Hitler, Stalin launched an anti-fascist policy which gave communism a new lease of life. In the popular front of France and Spain, communism grew and established itself. The fight against fascism in Spain by the International Brigade took on a mythical allure that masked the other face of communism, elimination of opponents, purges, deportation, and the gulags. In August 1939, the world was shocked by the German-Soviet non-aggression pact, a reversal of policy imposed by First Secretary Stalin. The German attack on the USSR in June 1941 brought communism back to the good fight. Stalin issued orders for mobilization against the Nazi invaders. Uncle Joe, with all civil and military powers in his hands, rekindled national pride. Russian soldiers headed for the front, singing for the homeland, for Stalin. At the end of 1942, the Battle of Stalingrad began. For Hitler, victory in the city named after the Soviet leader was a personal challenge. For Stalin, it was a matter of defending his own legend. For several months, the terrible house-to-house -house fighting reduced the city to rubble. German capitulation was a turning point in the war. From then on, it was clear that the Soviet Union, made strong by its size and the patriotic mobilization of its people, could not lose. Throughout Europe and the world, Stalingrad symbolized hope and freedom, an irony which characterizes one of the worst tragedies of the century. Due to the victory of the Red Army, Stalin's name became synonymous with the victory of democracy over barbarity. With the Stalingrad effect, communism had made history again. Millions of men and women took up the armed struggle, like these young members of the Paris resistance tried before the occupation court.
these resolved teenagers died courageously in front of a German firing squad, shouting, Long live Stalin! By the summer of 1944, the Soviet steamroller was unstoppable. The Red Army entered a destroyed Warsaw. Instead of crossing Poland to Berlin, Stalin ordered a large part of his troops to the Balkans in order to head off the British and Americans. Thus, the USSR liberated Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary. Next, the Russians joined up with Tito's resistance movement that had freed large parts of Yugoslavia itself. Thus, even before the war was over, the Soviets had taken control of Eastern Europe. In April, the Red Army launched its final assault on Berlin and soon the hammer and sickle flew over the capital of the Reich. Sacrifice de 19 habitants d'Aubervilliers fusillés par l'ennemi et dont les corps vont reposer maintenant dans le cimetière communal. <coughs> Brun Lucien, 35 ans, secrétaire de la section d'Aubervilliers, arrêté en octobre 40, 5 tentatives d'évasion, évadé de Châteaubriand reprend son activité, arrêté de nouveau en 1942, fusillé à Niort le 16 avril 1943. Carré Gaston, 37 ans, commandant des brigades internationales. After the war, the French Communist Party grew in prestige. It promoted its involvement in the resistance movement and claimed to be the party of the 75,000 shot by the Nazis. The communist leaders cultivated the memory and glory of the martyrs. The French Communist Party took full advantage of public opinion of the USSR and its army. The Soviet Union had won the war. Just like in the 30s, the anti-fascist ticket was used to sell communism. Nazism was judged and condemned both by history and in the Nuremberg trials. Fascism was outlawed by humanity. Those who had beaten it were naturally the good guys. Nazi barbarity masked the crimes of Stalin. Auschwitz and Dachau overshadowed the Gulag. The Communist Party was given a role in government and took every opportunity to glorify the actions of its ministers, presented as special envoys of the people in the top spheres of the state. The Communists were the champions of Reconstruction, and Torres rallied his troops in the War of Production. Et voici l'homme le plus aimé des travailleurs, le plus redouté des trusts, Maurice Torres, vice-président du Conseil. Sa présence au gouvernement est le gage le plus sûr de la participation du peuple aux affaires du pays. Auteur du statut des fonctionnaires, il garantit aux modestes serviteurs de la République la stabilité de leur emploi et la juste rétribution de leur dévouement. Mais avant tout, il a convié le peuple de France à l'effort. Il a guidé les mineurs à la victoire du charbon. 
At the first post-war Fête de l'Humanité, the huge crowd of sympathizers and members showed that the Communist Party had become the biggest political party in France. Backed by one in four voters and supported by the mass unions, bringing in millions of workers, the French Communist Party had reached its peak. Au nom du comité central du Parti communiste, j'ai la joie immense et la grande fierté de remettre au camarade Prouveau, un mineur de bruit en artois, la carte du millionième adhérent du Parti communiste français. The Communist Party held the whole of France in its spell, added to high public opinion of the USSR and the glory of the resistance was the new strength of a working class which was embodied more than ever in the party. The worker was the artisan of progress, the builder of a new tomorrow. Belonging to the party meant standing with the proletariat, the authors of international transformation, it meant helping to make history. In Italy, the Communist Party was reintegrated into politics after 20 years hiding under fascism. The achievements of the resistance and the heroism of its partisans earned the party unprecedented respect. In just a few months, a small group of several thousand illegal militants grew into an enormous party with more than two million members, half of which were workers and peasants. Togliatti, back from his exile in Moscow, strove to unite the left wing. The Italian Communist Party, like its French counterpart, participated in government. Through a multitude of associations, unions and newspapers, it had a determining influence on Italian politics. From the writer Cesare Pavese and the film director Lucino Visconti to the farm workers occupying the land, the Italian Communist Party began to represent the whole spectrum of Italian society. power and impetus of European communism began to worry the United States. The U.S. decided to rescue the battered economies of Europe in order to calm social tensions, which made states susceptible to communist intervention. The Marshall Plan was also offered to the East. But Stalin, after consideration, refused all interference in his zone.
Europe was split in two. America's customers on one side, the Soviet satellite states on the other. Stalin's influence stretched out like the coming of the Ice Age, and the Cold War was born. 1947 saw the post-war end of the great anti-fascist alliance. In September of that year, Stalin established the new international, the common form, to replace the third international disbanded in 1943. The communist movement saw the world divided into two camps, one imperialist and warlike supporting the USA, the other peace-loving and in favor of progress led by the USSR. The role of all communist parties was to defend the homeland of socialism against the warmongers of America. But the illusion was short-lived. The union which had grown from the resistance movement collapsed and the communists lost power. It was time to go on the offensive. From autumn 1947, there was spectacular change as Torres and the party ordered insurrectionary strikes. Paris was under siege. Throughout the whole country, the miners' strike unleashed a wave of solidarity orchestrated by the Communist Party. Dès le début de la grève, la solidarité de la France entière se manifeste avec force. Toutes les couches sociales apportent leur aide, sachant bien que les justes revendications des mineurs, ce sont les justes revendications de tous. Des paysans, comprenant combien le sort de l'ouvrier est lié au leur, envoient des vivres de toutes sortes, car ils savent bien qu'aider les mineurs, c'est défendre leur propre cause. Les petits commerçants ferment leurs boutiques, marquent leur entière approbation. Et dans tout le pays, un magnifique élan soulève les honnêtes gens. Tous les gosses, les pauvres gosses des mineurs qui souffrent injustement, sont accueillis à bras ouverts, réclamés par le peuple de la France. qui, selon l'expression même de Jouot, espérait laisser pourrir la grève, est obligé de constater que l'entraide et la solidarité de tous permettent aux mineurs de tenir. Et plein de fureur, ils dépêchent les ambassadeurs habituels. Et ces images imposent un terrible rapprochement. Des enfants qui fuient et des soldats qui montent, images de guerre, images de la guerre que le gouvernement déclare au peuple. Battles with the army gave the impression of civil war. Against the riot police and the soldiers sent as backup, the miners were in no doubt as to the just nature of their combat. In the occupied colliery towns, as on the international stage, the two camps faced off. In Eastern Europe, Stalin advanced his pawns. In countries where communists participated in popular front governments, Sovietization was enforced. In a matter of months, in Poland, Bulgaria, and Hungary, with the same procedures, the same fixed elections, communist parties took complete power. In the name of unification of workers' parties, the communists absorbed their socialist allies slice by slice, according to Hungarian communist leader Rakoshi, who called the process salami tactics. In February 1948, the communist coup in Prague finished off the freezing of Eastern Europe. Groups of armed workers enabled the communist party to take over the government.
Klimen Gottwald became the leader of Red Czechoslovakia. Throughout the East, Stalin imposed his political, economic, and social model. Sovietization meant the confiscation of all powers by the Communist Party, the creation of political police and its accompanying terror, and the enforced presence of Soviet advisors. Five-year plans were launched, which, as they had done in the USSR, gave priority to heavy industry. For the ideological education of the people, tried and trusted methods were used. Just like in Big Brother Russia, socialist competitiveness meant that examples were made of workers who had surpassed production targets. The Soviet bloc was indeed a bloc, but Yugoslavia was the exception. Tito, who had led the resistance, demanded independence from the communist camp. From then on, for daring to oppose Stalin, he was condemned. The communist faith would not stand for dissidents, because unlike Trotsky's heresy, which was a diaspora of a few thousand individuals, Tito's concerned an entire party and nation. Communist propaganda set about denouncing Tito, who was likened to Hitler and Franco. His split from the USSR shocked intellectuals who had trouble understanding how yesterday's partisan could suddenly become a fanatical fascist. In the West, the majority of party members followed the line, accepted the unlikely truth. Once again, in a world now divided into red and white, there was no room for doubt. To exercise Tito's ghost and ensure none of the other satellite states be tempted by his refusenik line, Stalin set up a series of fixed trials. Like a decade before in Moscow, confession was essential to showing that the party could not be wrong. Rudolf Slansky, general secretary of the Czech Communist Party, took the stand. <laughs> a o počátcích své politické činnosti. Přišel jsem do dělnického hnutí jako člověk buržázního původu. Můj otec byl zámožným vesnickým obchodníkem. Vyrůstal jsem v prostředí obchodnické rodiny a to ovlivnilo mé osobní vlastnosti a můj charakter. Vstoupil jsem v roce 1921 do komunistické strany a přišel jsem tam s různými maloměšťáckými názory, kterých jsem se nezbavil. 
to vedlo k tomu, že jsem se nestal skutečným komunistou a že jsem jako komunista nejednal, že jsem neplnil a nemohl plnit čestně povinnosti, které vyplývaly z mého členství v komunistické straně. Proč se tak stalo? A pro dnes, proč dnes sedí tato spiklenecká banda jako hnízdo pochytaných krys, nenáviděná, opovrhovaná všemi čestnými lidmi naší země, na lavici obviněný? Spiklenci způsobili naší vlasti nesmírné miliardové škody. A přece vítězně plníme plán a stavíme nový krásný život pro nás i pro příští pokolení této země. Občané souci, ve jménu našich národů, proti již svobodě a štěstí zločinci povstali. Ve jménu míru, proti němu se hanebně spikli. Žádám pro všechny obviněné trest smrti. I have enough to do with the innocent claiming innocence, without worrying about the guilty who admit their guilt said French poet Paul Éluard, to those who sought his support for the victims of the trials in Czechoslovakia and Hungary. In October 1949, Mao took power in China after his 20-year-long march. From early on, Chinese communism was the embodiment of nationalism against the Japanese invader. By copying Soviet ideology and methods, Mao had managed to mobilize millions of peasants in revolt against the landowners. The Soviet system was the model for Chinese communists. They gave the same priority to heavy industry and centralized planning. As a sign of Soviet preeminence, materials and consultants arrived in force from the USSR. As in Russia 20 years earlier, the land was forcibly collectivized. Medium and large landlords were subjected to public trial and condemnation. For like its Soviet comrade, the Chinese regime was essentially totalitarian, with a complete domination of its society by the party. In Beijing, as in Moscow, the concentration of power at the head of the party led to the same bureaucratic paralysis and the same unjust procedures. The East had turned red. From the Albi to the China Sea, half the world's population was united by communist ideology. Since 1917, communism had been promoting internationalism. It had at last become a geographical reality. Communism was now an unstoppable force. Since 1946, in Indochina, the Ho Chi Minh-led Viet Minh had been fighting a war of independence against French colonials. Ho Chi Minh's smile, a revolutionary in sandals, shows a more human look of the communist hero. France was embroiled in a dirty war, convinced it was defending the interest of the West against communism. The French Communist Party rose up in opposition to the war. 
In Marseille, the dockers refuse to load boats with weapons and military supplies. The Communist Party campaigned for the release of Henri Martin, a Navy quartermaster accused of anti-militarist propaganda. The Communists were joined in their anti-colonial struggle by Christians and intellectuals. Early 1950, North Korean troops supported by the Chinese crossed the 38th parallel. The Cold War was heating up. The United States entered the conflict under the banner of the UN. fighting in Korea for our own national security and survival. We have committed ourselves to the cause of a just and peaceful world order through the United Nations. We stand by that commitment. The West lived in fear of communist expansion. Panic swept America. In the streets of New York, demonstrators denounced Stalin as the new Hitler. Hollywood became involved, and propaganda movies warned there was a red under every bed. Cold War became a war of ideology. The Soviets and their faithful skillfully ensured the people knew they were on the side of good against evil. In this new polarized conflict, communism had found the ideal target in America. Stalin spoke to the people of the threat of fascism disguised in the Star-Spangled Banner. They had to fight to defend peace. Stalin's argument was indisputable. If you believed in peace, you were against America because America wanted war. With the pacifist ticket, the communist movement's appeal went far beyond the usual sympathizers. In France and Italy, millions signed the Stockholm Appeal a call to ban all nuclear weapons. Academics, artists, writers, and actors stood shoulder to shoulder with the Communist Party denouncing U.S. war ambitions. Biggest names in literature and movies brought prestige to this worthy fight. Who could be against peace? Picasso painted the famous Dove, international symbol of peace that became the movement's own.
and when workers from the Renault factory brought him the collected signatures, he presented them with one of his works. Communist influence in the peace movement was not even questioned when the USSR tested its own nuclear bomb. Across the Atlantic, Americans lived in fear of imminent nuclear conflict. The Red Bomb fed the anti-communist paranoia. My name is Ronald Reagan. Last year, the contributions of 16 million Americans to the crusade for freedom made possible the World Freedom Bell, symbol of hope and freedom to the communist-dominated peoples of Eastern Europe. The crusade for freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Join now by sending your contributions to General Clay, Crusade for Freedom, Empire State Building, New York City, or join in your local community. In this climate of mass psychosis, America was convinced that the Russians had built the bomb with help from spies. The Rosenbergs, accused of delivering state nuclear secrets, were condemned to the electric chair. The world, undisturbed by the hangings in Prague and Budapest, was mobilized by the Communist Party and sprang to the Rosenbergs' defense. America has rabbis, wrote Jean-Paul Sartre. Denunciation was total. Everything coming from America was suspect. Coca-Cola, refrigerators, Mickey Mouse, and lifestyle. Les films américains porteurs d'une idéologie étrangère envahissent nos salles. Les livres américains submergent les étalages de nos libraires. Les producteurs de films et les maisons d'édition étrangères à la faveur d'accords prétendus économiques et culturels installent en France même and we're not going to be held up by any such foolishness. Le général Thompson nous fait part de son étonnement devant ce retard inexplicable. Monsieur le maire, vous m'avez bien dit que tout était réglé avec cette veuve Moulin. Mais enfin, monsieur le préfet... Madame Moulin, Madame Moulin, now, gentlemen, we're not going to hold up the defense of Europe for Madame Moulin. In eight days, the bulldozers arrive and we'll take over. Le général Thompson vient de vous informer que sous huit jours, les bulldozers procéderont aux premiers travaux de l'aérodrome. Monsieur le maire, vous avez tous les pouvoirs nécessaires. Agissez. The Communist Party led the campaign against U.S. air bases on French soil. In this propaganda film shot in the building of communist newspaper L'Humanité, the soldiers that liberated France are accused of being the new occupiers. For G.I. read S.S. Chamke, qui a fait fusiller votre fils. Thompson, qui veut vous prendre votre maison. Ce sont les mêmes, Madame Moulin. Si on les laisse faire, ce sera pour faire la même chose, la guerre. Il faut le dire aux autres, Madame Moulin.
During these years, communism was at its peak. Worship of Uncle Joe Stalin was akin to that of a pope. Millions of faithful gathered at the altars of the communist church. For Stalin's 70th birthday, communists all over the world sent gifts. Across France, even from secluded villages, thousands of presents were collected and sent by special train to Moscow. Nous rendons hommage à Staline. Nous rendons hommage à notre passé. Nous éclairons notre présent. Nous annonçons notre avenir. La France de montrer comment elle s'est aimée. À l'entreprise Aubry, chantier Bonne Nouvelle, nous avons les yeux fixés vers l'Union soviétique, qui a à sa tête l'homme du socialisme, l'homme de la paix, qui consacre toute sa vie prodigieuse à la grande cause de la classe ouvrière et conduit les peuples vers la joie et le bonheur. Toute notre sympathie, toute notre reconnaissance, tous nos espoirs, vont au peuple de l'Union soviétique et à leur guide éclairé. The faith was followed in every country. Maurice Torres, object of similar worship, visited the display of gifts destined for Stalin. In Italy, Togliatti experienced similar adoration. Celebration of the leader's birthday was an opportunity to gather the masses of believers at one huge service and to mobilize. More than ever, being a communist in the early 50s was to belong to a family, to have a concept of the world, to have an ethos. The communist had the strong, unshakable belief that wherever he was, he had a role in freeing mankind. The militant belonged to a different world, the world of tomorrow, a better world, one that indeed already existed in the USSR, the home of socialism. Le travail n'est plus le dur esclavage de nos grands bains industriels, c'est une affaire d'honneur. Quelle certitude exaltante Savoir que chaque minute de votre effort contribue non pas à l'enrichissement d'un privilégié, mais à l'accroissement du bien-être général. Se dire que chaque jour qui passe apporte, grâce à l'effort commun, de nouvelles richesses au pays. La production n'est plus livrée à l'anarchie, au désordre cruel d'un monde où règnent les intérêts de quelques-uns, mais elle est ordonnée selon un plan harmonieux d'après les ressources nationales et pour satisfaire aux besoins de tous. La plaie du chômage a disparu avec l'exploitation du travail humain. Il y a du travail pour tous, quand les instruments de travail, quand les machines, les usines, les mines, le sol sont la propriété de tous. Et quand tout le monde travaille, quand le système du profit personnel est aboli, le pays tout entier veut la paix. The French and Italian parties had become counter-societies, capable of giving to all who joined both aid and support. In 
in their bastions. The parties provided a social life for the people through a network of associations, ranging from holiday colonies to sports clubs. Members became emotionally tied to the party. Membership was as much about community as it was about politics. As a communist, you chose your peers. You stood with your pals in a world where I'm all right, Jack, had lost all meaning. The strength of communism's ties created unbreakable solidarity, which left no room for doubt. Cast iron belief, certainty about the future, and limitless self-denial turned communist militancy into a religion. As a party member, you changed your own life before you helped change the lives of others. The need to believe in an absolute found fulfillment in secular communist faith. The quest for brotherhood was achieved in a movement where members were on first name terms with their leaders. When Stalin died in March 1953, millions of communists mourned a friend, a comrade who had given meaning to their lives. It was the end of an era.